Well, as we gather around God's Word this morning, if you are ages 3 through 9 and you would like to go to children's worship with our children's minister, Brother Jeremy McCowan, he is standing by to my left, to your right, and he is ready to receive those that are coming to him. We also always applaud the efforts of every family to um, have in their mind the goal of worshiping together as a family. And we always believe that is the best, but uh, we also understand different seasons of life and try to um, uh, make uh, every effort we can to help that. We're going to Titus chapter 1 today. Titus chapter 1. Four of the five elders are here today. Brother Josh Blanton. Um, because of the topic, said, I'm not going to be there for that. I'm teasing. He's preaching somewhere else um, for another brother. Uh, he's preaching for them in, in the preacher's, in the pastor's absence. So be prayerful for him. The reason why I bring that up is because um, elders are on the... The chopping block, quite frankly, the examination table um, in this text. And not just elders, but all of those depraved elders' children. And um, as we look at this text, we see that Titus is left in Crete. Paul, as an apostle, is giving him instructions under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. To select and appoint elders, plural, in the churches that are gathering in Crete. And not any person will do. There are qualifications. And as we look in our text today, we will read through verses 5 all the way through verse 9. But our attention today will just be on verse number 6. Verse number 5 begins this way, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery and insubord or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Verse number six, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Let's pray together. Lord of heaven and earth, our glorious Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, to you alone we give thanks we give devotion, we give worship, we give praise. You have given us the gift of faith to believe in your Son. By grace we have been saved and we now have peace with God. Praise be to your name. Help us as we go to your word this morning. Help us to understand its context, its central meaning. But help us to apply it to our lives in appropriate ways so that we can glorify you. Help me to teach your word in spite of my sinfulness. Lord, may the spokesman not get in the way of absolute truth today. Help us to understand your word in Jesus' name. 
Amen. It is obvious from the list that character is more important than capabilities with elders. Character is more important than capabilities. What is done in private matters. What is done in the personal life matters even before the public responsibility is displayed. And I want to just say from the get-go that if you're looking for a perfect one, count me out. Because I fail regularly, constantly. And especially when you stack my life up against all of these requirements, if I were to have to be held to the standard of 100% on all of them, I would fail, my kids would fail. So how do we look at this text? What does it mean? How are we supposed to gauge things? If character is more important than capabilities, what kind of character are we looking for? Titus, what kind of character are you to be looking for in the people at Crete? And is this a standing order for those we are looking for in our day? I believe the answer is yes. The first word in verse number 6 that jumps out to us is if anyone is above reproach. Most translations in the English render this, I think, in a very good way by using the word blameless. It is the Greek word anakletos. It's a compound word, meaning not, that prefix ah on the front end negates it, so it means not accusable, not accusable. It means not having been called or arraigned before a judge, free from blame, not accused of having done anything wrong. There's another list that we could look at if we took the time to do it. It's in 1 Timothy 3. There is a similar word used. It's not an identical word that renders itself the same way in English, above reproach, but it's not the same Greek word. In 1 Timothy, it's a slightly different word, anapalimtos. It means not able to be laid a hold of. So there is a little difference, although the meaning, I can understand why the English translated it in a very similar way. It means that nothing wrong stands out. There's nothing, it, we could look at it this way. If you threw mud upon in the form of malicious words or accusations, it would not stick upon this particular person. The, the things thrown at them would not stick. It does not mean perfect or sinless. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8 dispels that myth when the Scripture says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Being above reproach also does not mean that every elder will be liked by everyone. It doesn't mean that. It means that the elder has not formally been accused of actual wrongdoing, especially within the community at large. 1 Timothy 3.7 says, Moreover, he must have a good testimony among those who are outside. Outside of what? Outside of the church. In other words, there should not be a slanderous reputation towards the elder that uh, would cause disrepute for the kingdom of God or for the church. He needs to be blameless. He needs to be above reproach. Now, first of all, I want to make mention to you that this is not just a requirement for elders. According to the Word of God, being above reproach is a command for us all. It's a command that goes long beyond just elders. Listen to Colossians 1.22. The whole reason Jesus died for us is summed up here. He says, Colossians 1.22, in order to present you before him holy and blameless and above reproach. So the goal, not just for the elder, but the aim even of every Christian is to be blameless, is to be 
above reproach. Beyond reproach here is the same Greek word in Colossians 1.22 that he uses in Titus 1. Same Greek word. So every Christian should be striving for this attribute, like Ephesians chapter 5, verse 15. Be careful how you walk. Be careful how you walk. Our reputation is important. It's not so important that we should be enslaved to it, but it is important. We could ask questions like this in regards to our reputation. If we're talking about character, and that's generally who we are when no one's watching, If we're talking about that, then the question should come to our minds for self-examination. If what I'm doing in private were made public, would I be ashamed? We could ask it like this. If the police knew what I was doing, would I be ticketed? Would I be arrested? If my co-workers knew this, would this bring about reproach? to my reputation. Now, you need to understand this also. Not only is it our reputation that should be something that concerns us, I'm not saying enslave yourself to what people think, but I am saying that your reputation should be one that is above reproach. But let's think about even further than that, Christ's reputation. Even if you don't mind what people see about you personally, Remember also that unbelievers are looking at us to see the nature of Christ. Obviously, they see it imperfectly because we fall short of the glory of God. But they're looking at us to be above reproach. Christ told us through Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.20 that we, you and I, are ambassadors for Christ as though God were making an appeal through us. Now think about that. We could ask this. Does God's appeal through me have any appeal? If God is using us as ambassadors of himself (coughs) and he's appealing to people through us, is there anything appealing and Godward about us? Now, listen, that does not mean that it's us that actually win people. It means that they see something winsome in us and through us, and we can give a reason for that that situation, and that is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Instead, sometimes we excuse ourselves with our sinful behavior, and Romans 2 would say, say to us and command us, Romans 2, 23 through 24, Through your breaking the law, do you dishonor God? For the name of God is blasphemed among the nations because of you. Could it be that um, it is true that some people in our cultures have never really witnessed a true follower of Jesus Christ? They see people who state the name of Jesus but their life speaks otherwise. Their actions speak different than what they claim. So we need to be above reproach. Let me give you a few examples of being above reproach. And let me be specific about this. I'm I'm pulling up some examples from Scripture where people accused them falsely or tried to trap them And they maintained being above reproach. So the reason I'm bringing these three up is because sometimes we have an easy time being above reproach when everything's good, everything's easy. But what about when things get hard? Do we maintain being above reproach? Jesus is our clearest example of this. Mark chapter 3, verse 1, a man was there whose hand was withered. And they were watching him, the Pharisees were watching him to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. Now the point here is they're ready at any moment to pounce. They are ready at any moment to accuse falsely Jesus our Christ. And let me say to you that part of 
The New Testament is abundantly clear by telling us that anybody who wants to live godly will be persecuted. And part of that persecution is when you're trying to live godly, every co-worker you've got around you is waiting for you to just cuss or mess up or say something foolish or do something that's not becoming. They're looking for a way to bring you down to a little bit below reproach where you can be blamed instead of being blameless. This happened with Jesus. It will happen with us. But let me give you another example. Stephen. Stephen, in the book of Acts, chapter 6, they were unable to cope with the, Alexand- with the wisdom and spirit with which Stephen was speaking. This is verse 10. Then they secretly induced men to say, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they put forward false witnesses who said, This man incessantly speaks against this holy place and the law. But I want you to notice something. At this point, Stephen is remaining above reproach. But what about when they hurl insults? What about when they falsely accuse? Did you know that the way you respond to false accusations, if incorrectly, can put you in a category of not being above reproach? The way that you react when someone falsely accuses you is an opportunity for you to be above reproach then or not above reproach. Listen to the way Stephen responds when they do uh, corner him. Listen, Stephen could have pointed out all kinds of things. But your reaction to false accusation and Stephen's reaction to false accusation was holy, was God-honoring. Acts chapter 6 verse 15 says, And fixing their gaze on Stephen, all who were sitting in the council saw his face like the face of an angel. Man, they keep throwing the false accusations at him, and he just keeps shining Jesus. How you respond also says something about you. We can, or let me say first of all, we cannot keep people from saying things that they want to say. The beauty of free speech is free speech. And you're not going to be able to muzzle people all the time for saying things that are false accusations. But you can prevent them from having more ammunition to launch against you by responding the right way when they do that. So being above reproach is kind of like what 1 Peter 3.16 says, Keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ will be put to shame. Another example I would give to you, but I'm going to omit for sake of time because there's so much more to talk about, is Job. Job. They falsely accuse him. He responds with godliness, with a searching for the Lord to make clear to him why he's suffering in the way he's suffering. So the qualification for elders, as mentioned in Titus chapter 1, verse 6, it is certainly true that elders are to be above reproach. But I want to just make sure that you understand that that is also a command for all Christians to be above reproach. Now chapter 1 verse 6 in Titus says, The husband of one wife. Wow. The interpretations over the years of this text. The husband of one wife. The first to bring to your attention that became very popular and moved over from Europe into Western um, Catholicism was actually the fuel for this. Being married to the church is actually what they meant. Husband of one wife means 
being married to the church and the wife is allegorized or spiritualized to mean the church since that means married men with real wives do not qualify. That promoted the celibacy, the singleness of the Catholic priesthood for a number of years and still to this day in some circles still does. It was used constantly by the Roman Catholics. Just in case you're wondering, I do not hold that interpretation. Another interpretation, an elder must be married because he is the husband of one wife. And if he is not a husband, then he can't be an elder because you've got to be married to be an elder. Otherwise, he wouldn't have said husband of one wife. In this case, they would suggest that unmarried men do not qualify, which, by the way, knocks out Jesus, knocks out Paul. A third interpretation, only ever married once, whether before or after becoming a Christian, widowers who remarry do not qualify. Here's another interpretation. They can never be divorced either before or after becoming a Christian. Widowers who remarry are acceptable as elders. Here's another one. Never divorced. This means never divorced after being born again. A man who is divorced while a Christian is not eligible. Some have translated this to mean this is talking about monogamy. In other words, one wife at a time. Can't be a polygamist. Still don't for the life of me understand why anybody would want to be. Number seven. The other interpretation. A moral husband for all time. Any husband who has, ne- who has ever been unfaithful does not qualify. And although unfaithful, the man may not be divorced. As long as he's not divorced. And another one. For a sufficient period of time, this has to be a moral, faithful husband in the present, in the right now. Now, you can see the complexity of this characteristic. And maybe right now you're going, well, just glad I don't have to decide. Actually, yes, you do. You'll have to make decisions based on the Word of God on a regular basis. It's kind of like the predestination thing. You say, I'll just leave that alone. You can't. It's in the Bible. You can't leave it alone. Well, we'll just let this take care of itself. Well, sometimes take care of itself comes and stares you right in the face until you deal with let it take care of itself. And and listen, folks, there are situations that I just mentioned that are, are a description of a different variety of people in this very room. And make no mistake about it, some of us qualify as elders, some of us don't. Some of us qualify as deacons, some of us don't. And there's a reason and a a method as to how we come to that conclusion. So which one is it? David, where do you, what what do you say? Let Let me tell you how dangerous it is to rely on what David says. I was talking to my wife about this yesterday. You know, when I was growing up, you know who I read as a commentary? My preacher. Because I didn't know about commentaries. All I had was a Schofield reference Bible. That's all I had. The study notes in the Bible. I didn't know about commentaries. They all existed. I didn't know about commentaries. Didn't read any commentaries. Didn't even even know about really church history and what people said for 2,000 years. And by the way, 
If you throw out what people have said for 2,000 years, that's very arrogant. To think that 2,000 years later, you got something new and true that somebody 2,000 years ago, 2,000 years through church history, had no clue about. That's what I feel about any time I hear about the secret books like that. The apostles and churches have went through centuries, and y'all figured it out? What, are you kidding me? Don't ignore church history. It's vitally important. But I didn't read commentaries. My preacher, my pastor, was my commentary. And for some of you in this room, what a dangerous thing and a heavy thing for me that I am your commentary. Man, that's scary. It brings a heaviness upon me that I, I must teach God's Word. But listen to me, you got to be a Berean. you got to be noble. you got to be searching those Scriptures to see if what I'm saying is true. You've got to do a diligent job of that. So, what is our stand on this? Well, let me just give you some things to think about. Number one, the literal Greek New Testament words this in a way that is most easily translated one woman man one woman man if you got it in a particular order it comes it's actually man of one woman one woman man a man of one woman now this is the translation but how do we Select, how do we confirm? For example, if believers are forever limited by their pre conversion sins, then what are we to make of restoration of individuals such as Moses, guilty of murder? What did God do with him? Led the people out of Egypt. What do we do with people like David? Now we could agree that his kingship went down in the tank after his sin. But he is still a leader. What about Paul? What did he do pre-conversion? It's funny... He killed people and never went to prison. He stops killing people and spends all his time in prison. So if pre-conversion sins weigh heavily, how heavily? I'm not saying they don't. Is it logical to preach reconciliation and cleansing from all sin, including murder in the case of Moses, David, and Paul, and then hold up divorce as a more serious sin, which disqualifies a person? Now, by the way, in this preaching moment, I'm baiting you, okay? I, I, I'm getting you to think, prayerfully think, and maybe right now you're going... I knew that's what he thought. Well, I, let me just give you a flash. That's not what I think. So keep going with me on this. What about the issue of he must be married? He must be married. We've talked about that. We rule out people like Paul, Jesus. What did Paul say? 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. I wish that all men were even as I myself am. What was he? Single. He also said, he also said, it's better for someone not to marry. Not to marry. And this being one of the apostles. Paul is unmarried. And what about this widow issue? Can someone who has passed away be a, an elder if they remarry and their first spouse has passed away? And by the way, you only have to go to Danville to find a church that says no. They can only have one wife for a lifetime. 
So there is a difference of opinion on this thing. Who can qualify? Who can be one of these elders? Well, some might say, well, when conversion happens makes a big difference in how you judge a person. Now that I can agree with. What happens pre-conversion can have a consequence. If it's big enough to cause reputation questions, then it's big enough to not push towards the qualification of an elder. If it's a big enough sin that causes reproach on the kingdom, it's big enough to say stop. But then you get into the question of this. If someone can be an elder, if their divorce happened prior to conversion, the next question is, when did conversion happen? Well, I know when it happened. I wrote it down in the front of my Bible. Let me see what day that was. Then we get into that. What's the answer to this? Well, it's at the risk of sounding like a chicken. I want to tell you what the answer is. It's case by case. It's situation by situation. I believe that. And that does not mean, ah, I sure do like Cody. I'd love for him to be an elder. He's been married nine times, then he got saved. And all nine of his ex-wives want to kill him. I think he'd be a great elder. He loves Jesus. That's not true, by the way, about Cody. It was eight. (laughs) Joking. Thank you for letting me joke with you, Cody. Every situation is different. Every situation has complexities that come to the table. But there are some standing orders that cannot be excused. And so if you struggle with that one, and you're not really sure and you're struggling with who can, who can't, I'm going to tell you that the next section will probably answer the question more clearly about the marital situation because if a person doesn't manage their home well and by the way I would say that a divorce that happens is a reflection that somebody didn't manage their home well that's a disqualifier let's go to the next section husband of one wife and by the way you think listen my wife used to be terrified where's she hiding at oh there you are sitting by yourself that's wise in trouble all by yourself she used to torment herself over expectations that she thought that the churches had including this one when we first came there of what they thought the pastor's wife should do I remember her saying constantly I can't play the piano Where's that? What chapter and verse is that in? Can't play the piano. Concerned. And those are traditional expectations imposed upon us by the culture. But folks, listen, even though she can't play the piano, her character matters greatly to the health of this church. Let me tell you something. I'm not dumb. Everybody can think of a preacher's wife that didn't do what the preacher's wife probably should have done according to the Bible. Not according to your thoughts, but according to the Bible. For example, if a preacher's wife don't show up to church, her husband ought not be the preacher. Yes or no? Well, I'm afraid to say yes. That sounds like I'm judging. You are judging. Of course you are. I'm just asking you to do it publicly. 
you know that that matters. You know, you know, listen to me. You know that if, a, if, a, if, if somebody came up to you and, and a female in this church came up to you and went off on you, you say, That's, that wouldn't be good. That would not be good if somebody did that. But what if Margaret did that? Folks, listen, whether, whether, whether y'all admit it or not, it takes on a whole nother level. Because there's example setting and discipleship that is called upon for every elder to be a husband of one wife. And then he gets personal more by calling upon the kids of those elders to be a particular way. Now, what, what kind of stigma do we have to overcome here in this culture? You know them preacher's kids. Ooh, them preacher's kids. Mm, mm mm-mm. Yeah, as a matter of fact, I do know the preacher's kids very well. The old saying is, their corruption came from overexposure to the deacon's kids. (laughs) But the text says, and his children are believers. What does this mean? I have two dear men of God who I respect very highly that disagree on this issue. Doug Wilson, the writer of a very good book, Rediscovering Lost Tools of Learning, commented on this text, And said, if a man's children fall away from the faith, either doctrinally or morally, he is at that point disqualified from formal ministry in the church. Now, he goes on to say, as John MacArthur would as well, and I disagree with him, that this goes even beyond your own home. That when Madison and Isaiah leave 68 Watkins Avenue and begin a family of their own, their following of the Lord Christ and being believers, if they are not, disqualifies me from being an elder here. I do not agree with that. However, because I think there's a part of leaving and cleaving that uh, begins their own unit. However, As long as they are in your home, while you cannot do the salvation work that only the Spirit of God can do, and while you alone as a parent are not the one who works salvation, those children must live as believers. They must live as believers. The Christian principles set forth by the elder and his wife must be followed, even though maybe not believed upon, must be followed and obeyed. That's clear. Now, having faithful children, Alexander Strauss, who wrote the book on elders that that I so much love, said it like this. He said, the contrast in this text is not made between believing and unbelieving children. Rather, it is between obedient, respectful children and lawless, uncontrolled children. Andrew Strauss said, what is at stake here is the children's behavior, not the children's eternal state, which can only be resolved by God. I agree with him. Now, let me ask you a question. Would it affect the leadership of David Fralix if Madison and Isaiah were Hellions? Yes or no? Yes or no? Participation time. You say it wouldn't affect, affect it at all publicly. You're wrong. You're dead wrong. Well, I just can't, I can't bear to say it. I mean, I love those kids. They're just so precious. I don't want to have them having a, a, a higher standard than we should have for everybody else. 
The standard's the same. For your kids and my kids. The only issue is, mine is to be an example setting pattern of what you're supposed to do. Man, gosh, Isaiah, Maddie, no wonder you want to leave the house. Too much pressure. Well, folks, listen. Any man would be a fool to just straight up in his flesh want to be an elder. He'd be a fool. But there's a calling of God that cannot be shaken. It cannot be let go of. It's a call of God. His husband, he's to be the husband of one wife. His children are believers. They are faithful. The word pistis is there. Faithful. They are faithful children. And if you're wondering what the definition of faithful is, he gives it in the latter part of the verse. Faithful means not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. The children are not to be accused or accusable of the charge of dissipation or insubordination. Dissipation. The Greek word, asotios, it means this. It means behavior which shows a lack of concern or thought for the consequences of an action. In other words, senseless, reckless deeds. Now, I hope this does not include bungee jumping or roller coaster riding as reckless decision making because I promote those things among my children. I think, I think those things are interesting. I will not bungee jump, but I will videotape them bungee jumping. Um, now, if someone says, gosh, that's senseless, that's reckless, then it doesn't mean we have to enslave ourselves to public opinion, but we do have to consider we can't just flush everything. We can't just dismiss everything. It can't be out of control, undisciplined behavior. And what about not accused of insubordination? Insubordination, the Greek word means to be independent, not subject to the Father's authority or their authority in general, not subject to the Father's authority. I am thankful, and, and by the way, listen, um, there are times when I use Maddie and Isaiah a lot as examples, or I could use Abby, Emma, elders' kids as examples. There are times when I use them just off of the cuff, but I, listen, I, I, I'm not just... I'm, I'm trying my best not to exploit them, but to let them know and you know that if all elders die today at lunch, choking on bones, you better not just think it's one guy you're looking for to shepherd a flock. The whole family matters. The way they interact in a marriage, the way they interact in parenting, the way the, the, the kids and the parents relate, it matters. It matters. And they should not be open to the charge of insubordination. And I'm thankful that even at 20 and 19, that they, not perfectly, but they understand I'm going to give an account before God and they better ask me if I'm cool with what they're doing because the last thing I like are people to have information about my kids' sins before I do. Isn't that embarrassing to any of you parents? You find out from somebody else besides the kid that did it? Well, all of these things matter. 
Well, you say, well, I'm just glad I'm not an elder. I'm just glad I'm not a, a person who's going to be policed in that way. Well, elders may be the example setters, but you're not off the hook. Because God called us all to pursue holiness. And there is no possible way for us to do this unless something happens supernaturally to us. I went back last Sunday to verse number 4, and I want to go back there again. To Titus, my true child in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. I want to tell you that if you ever lose sight of grace that comes from God, and peace you have with Christ. If you ever lose sight of that, if you ever misunderstand that, if you ever don't have a good grasp of that, you will most likely always get every command wrong. Because every command is fulfilled by grace that God gives and peace that we have in Christ. For more on that, I want us to conclude in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. So many more things that I would like to say that would probably come out as condemnation to the culture. But I am concerned, honestly, as we think about what I was just talking about in Titus... I am concerned that many churches that look for pastors only interview the man, the guy. They never talk to the... To, sometimes they'll talk to the spouse. But they will never talk to the children. They won't interact with them. You say, well, we want to leave them alone. Folks, listen... You can't. You can't do that. The text is clear that it matters how they behave. It matters. Romans chapter 5 verse 1, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through Him we have also obtained access by faith into this grace in which we stand, and we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. At the end of the day, being an elder is not salvation. Being the kid of an elder is not salvation. Being the spouse of an elder is not salvation. What is salvation? is described in verse 1 and 2. We have been justified by faith. We've been made right by faith. Where did this faith come from? Ephesians 2 says it's a gift given to us by God. And now we have peace. We have a, a right relationship, not just a right standing judiciously, but we have a right relationship with God. We were once enemies. Now we have been made access. And we've been made into a relationship that's eternal. We did not have access before. And Christ has given us access through faith, by grace, and we forever stand in this grace. There, listen, I realize the bulk of our teaching today is on elders. But you need to understand that the first and foremost, the biggest issue is not who can be an elder when it comes down to what I just said. The biggest question is, do you know Christ? God is not going to ask you when you stand before Him, were you an elder? The question is going to be, not so much do you know Him, 
does he know you? And the only way he knows you is through grace given, faith imparted for you to trust in him. The only question is, what would you do with Jesus? Did you believe upon him? Did you trust him? I believe that elders matter. I believe that qualifications matter. But at the end of the day, Jesus ultimately is who matters. Let's pray together. Perhaps in the midst of this teaching, it is instructional to the family of God to know and be reminded of what elders are to be. I realize that. But also trust in the powerful word of God. The word that endures forever. The word that goes forward. And like a seed goes into the ear and into the mind and into the heart. And perhaps through the watering of that seed, God has brought it to life. And you want Jesus as Savior and Lord. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. If you have questions about that, you come and talk with us. We'd be happy to talk to you. Father, help us to grow in our faith. Help us to be very informed scripturally on what your mandate is for the church, for leadership, for leadership's families. Help us not to go beyond what is written but guard us from saying less than what is written. May you be glorified in our imperfect attempts to honor you as best we can. In Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you.